8.59, and since I want to chase all the men out at, at uh, 9.29 for you all to go see, um, we're going to go ahead and open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another day to come and worship you, to rejoice in the fact that you have chosen us to be an intimate part of your family. Father, we've been studying about the kingdom. I pray that as we leave today, we know even more about how your kingdom, how you act in your kingdom with us and upon us and for us, that we might see you acting more day by day and become more engaged in the progress of your sanctification of us, making us full in Christ. Be with uh, David and Alice while they're traveling. Let them have a great time together. We look forward to David being back next week to share with us as you continue to help us to grow under his teachings. Pray for Vicki and her driving back to Nashville that you be with her and keep her safe and well. Get her home. Father, I pray that whatever I say today, that the words that you mean for people to hear are anointed and that they will retain them and that whatever you don't want them to hear is, is lost, masked, and for that, I give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Christ's name, amen. Well, good morning. I know you came, most of y'all came expecting to see David here today. He is, to the best of my knowledge, well, he's not ill, but he and Alice are on a trip. And he asked me to fill in today, which is always challenging because uh, I, I definitely don't have the background and the education to... to provide an erudite explanation of scriptures on the scale that he does. However, in talking with him, I thought what we might do today is take what he's been focusing on the kingdom and what does that look like and what is kingdom living. And we keep looking at Jesus and the disciples, which is great, but sometimes we put a disconnect. Well, that's how he dealt with them. But he doesn't really deal with us that way, does he? And so I thought I might uh, take this time to share with you from my experience kind of a, a progress by which God has made me more and more aware of his kingdom in terms of daily operation and how he wants me to fit in. And I want to share with you a little bit about, uh, you may or may not be aware, the sabbatical search career group that I coordinate uh, is really a ministry. And it's one the churches is underwriting and supporting me in and uh, but it really is at its heart a manifestation of the kingdom just like we've been studying so I want to use that to kind of maybe help you have a glimpse of how God's dealt with me in the kingdom and maybe you start to see some of your own experiences following that pattern we know that God uses patterns for instruction and for changing us into what he wants us to be. So um, I am honored to serve today as an Alice and David are away. Um, I want to focus on this theme of the kingdom. And I want to say the kingdom is real. And it's here and it's now. Whether we recognize it or not, it does exist. And Christ is dwelling in it as are we, his sheep. Now, how different is this kingdom from the world's view? I mean, that's what David's been sharing with us. Stop to think about the myths of creation. What are the stories that man used to explain the creation? And we find that uh, in almost all cases, our world is the floatsome of warfare between the gods. Whether it's the Norse myths, or it's the Hindu myths, or it's the Greek myths, you know, there's been this conflict between the gods and we're kind of the junk that's left over. And then we open up Genesis 1 and we read this amazing revelation of how a master craftsman and artisan starts with a blank canvas and he starts to create. And all that proceeds from his creation, all the way through to the creation of a creature that God desires to be in a relationship with. 
And at the end of seven days, as he rests, guess what? He doesn't stop creating. But he turns it over to Adam, to Eve, to continue the process. Um, even as he created, God was placing the imprint of his kingdom upon all creation. How could it not be so when it was his son who was the active force of this creation? We read in John 1, 1 through 5, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. So all of creation was made through Jesus Christ. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Remember that darkness is not a thing in itself. Darkness doesn't exist as an entity. Darkness is simply the absence of light. Okay, you have light. You don't have darkness. You have light in the absence of light. This is where we kind of get off track sometimes. The yin and the yang, the good and the evil. There's a balance. No. Light is the presence of God. Darkness is the lack of that presence. And that's all built into this understanding of, king, of kingdom. Um, in John 1, 10 through 14, it says, He was in the world. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So this concept of kingdom that David's been enlightened on has been present and pervasive since the beginning. Note that John 1.10, the world does not know it. You know, we, we talked last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, about how Jesus said this stuff to the disciples. And it was just like, you know, it went right through they didn't hear it, they didn't understand it, but we know in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit, when it came, caused them to remember all this stuff. So the model was that the instruction occurred, the examples <laughs> occurred, the principles were presented, but in the proper time, under the power of the Holy Spirit, all this that had been absorbed now came to have application. Does that make sense? So that's why Jesus worked with his disciples, his intimate followers. Is there any reason to believe he deals with us differently? Is this model not perhaps the same model that God uses in our lives as we grow and mature and become, go from that being babes in Christ to being mature and eating the flesh? So, see how far I'm getting here. <laughs> So we know in Jeremiah 1, 5, he tells us, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated, which is to set apart, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Well, that verse is taken as being very specific to Jeremiah, but also being very general to all that God calls. You know, he doesn't say, well, I'm going to call Tim. I don't know what I'm going to do with him yet. You know, that rascal will tell him what he'll do. But one of these days I'll get around and no, he, he forms us with an intent, with a purpose. Um, so this word in Jeremiah, to know, carries an intimacy and foreknowledge of what we will become. Now y'all know what an axiom is? Uh, it's, an axiom is basically a statement or proposition that is regarded as being established, accepted, or self-evidently true. Okay? In other words, you say it, it just makes sense, and it, it, it's true. Here's an axiom that become very prominent in my life. If God is omnipotent, which means he accomplishes what he purposes, and I am not, then God wins. If he's going to accomplish his purpose with me, 
There's nothing I can do that will keep him from accomplishing that. Now, whether it's easy on me or hard on me, we may have some discussion about that. But ultimately, I will become what God wants me to become. So guess what? I can't blow it. I can't mess up so badly that God says, forget him. I'm going to go over here and do something else. That is so free. It is so absolutely free to know that I can get up today, I can get up tomorrow, and I am not going to do something that is just going to cut me apart from God. Because I can't. Because he's already got plans for me. So, in this kingdom world, how do we become what God intends us to be? Does he expose us to situations, experiences where we see and hear but don't understand or remember until a later time? He dealt with his disciples that way. Why not us? Let me share with you how I've come to understand this aspect of our world from a kingdom perspective. Perhaps it'll bring to mind some of the ways that God has dealt with in your life. If you have my business card, the first thing it says on the back is I'm an evangelist to business owners. I have an accreditation as a business mentor for small, medium-sized businesses and entrepreneurs. What I actually do is I help people speak out the vision that God's given them for their business and then show them how to execute on that vision in proper sequence. You can have all the right things to do, to do them in the wrong order and it be very disruptive. Um, and all this I do from a biblical perspective. When I have a new client, the first thing I tell them is I work from a biblical perspective. If that doesn't fit with you, then I'll help you find someone else who can work in a way that you, you want to work. But for me, truth is truth, whether you believe it or not. You don't have to believe it. The principles will work in your business. Some years ago, my friend Michael Dobbs started a career transition group at Covenant. When the economy was not performing so well, a lot of people were out of work for extended periods of time. Michael was well gifted in helping people get hired back into corporate jobs. He would have me participate from time to time, particularly when somebody came in saying, well, I'm sick of the corporate rat race and I want to do my own thing. How do I do my own business? And I would come alongside and help those folks. Uh, but I really wasn't a key player in the group. Then Michael was well on his way to developing his own business. He was actually had launched it and he received an offer from IBM for a job that in, required him to be almost weekly in the Far East, which took away his ability to lead the career group at Covenant. Well, interesting enough, he announces this. That day he announced that he was not going to be able to lead the group. There were three deacons from Covenant who were oversight for our transition group. So they wanted to talk to me. Sure. They got me in the hallway and they cornered me against the wall and proceeded to tell me that I was going to lead the career group in place of Michael. I adamantly said, no, I'm not. It's not my gifting. My gifting is working with small businesses. My gifting is working with entrepreneurs, not getting folks back into corporate jobs because that's how I saw the group. They didn't accept that. They literally would not let me leave until I agreed to take over the group until they found someone more appropriate. Little did I know, God had been sharing a lot of things with me that I wasn't listening to. I wasn't recalling. And my view of the group was wrong. So, I became the leader of the group, and shortly after that, trans that transition of mine, I met a lady who had been unemployed for 90 days. Her self-worth was zero. 
The fact that nobody would pay her to work equated to a message that she had no value. And as we talked, ideas, thoughts, experiences start flooding back. And the first thing I asked her is, I asked about her relationship with God, if she was, yeah, and she was a Christian, she was saved. My next question that I was led to ask was, does God know the next day you're going to get a paycheck? She thought about me, she said, yes. I said, is there anything you can do to make that happen sooner? She thought a little bit more and she said, well, no. And then I said, do you think your next employer will sacrifice his or her son for you? The answer very quickly was, no, they won't do that. I said, okay, let's figure this out. Your worth has already been established because God gave his son for you. There's no employer going to match that. So your worth is not tied to your employment. Your worth is tied to God. I said, now, looking at employment, wherever you were working before, God was through with you working there. You were done. He has something better for you. I said, look at this time, and this is, I said, look at this time in between jobs as a gift that God is giving you. She was unemployed for another 90 days. Oh, I said one more thing to her. I said, while you're in the job search, keep your eyes open for who God places in front of you. Because there are a lot of people in the world who need to experience God's presence. And a lot of people are busy working at their corporate jobs and aren't available to spend that time. And while you're on your job search, you do have flexibility with your time. And so when the person standing in front of you needs that time and needs to experience God's presence, do it through you. Be prepared for that time and ask God to open your eyes to the people who need that. As I said, it was another, 30, another 90 days before she got a placement. And when she got her job, she came back to me and she said, I want you to know the last three months have been the most exciting three months of my Christian life. Okay, what, did, what changed? She's, God enabled me to show her kingdom living through the job search. And it actually caused us to change the name of the group to sabbatical search. Why would we call it that? Well, if you think about what is a professor, you know, universities put big stock in professors going on sabbatical. I mean, they've got some sabbatical a lot. He always came back charged up and with great stuff to add. So what are the things that a professor does when they go on sabbatical? And I would suggest there are three things that they do. They expand their network of connections. They sharpen their technical skills. And then they spend time grappling with their passion that they have for the subject area, the topics and things to say, how do I want to express this next? Is it a new book? Is it a new course? Do I want to change institutions and go to one that's more focused on what I'm interested in? So this time of sabbatical is actually a gifting to allow a person who is going to be teaching others better. How do I reach more people? How do I fine tune my message? When we start looking at the time in between jobs, we, I don't like the word transition. Transition denotes confusion. I don't know what's coming next. Yeah, but God does. God's not confused. That's why we use change of sabbatical. And we look at this time in between jobs as being a focus for expanding our network of connections. Do you know that 90% of jobs now, the actual person that's hired is a person that someone in that organization took their resume and walked it into the hiring manager? It's up to 90% that that's how the job, the 10% of jobs that happen just because they pull the resume out of the file or from the application or stuff. 90% is because someone who knew someone in the organization 
was presented as a candidate. So networking is critical. Building those relationships, but that's not surprising. God is a God of relationships. Everything he does, if you even look at the parables, I would suggest to you, if you're confused about the parables, go back and start with the question, what does this tell me about relationship? The parable of the talents, I was teaching on it, and I was teaching that the, the servant that buried his talents was condemned to hell. Guess what? That's works. And God actually, the first time I actually experienced God speaking to me in a way that I audibly, in my head, heard. And he said, go read it again. <laughs> Not real good words that you want to hear from God the first time he actually speaks to you. <laughs> go read it again. I was out on a walk. I got back. I pulled out the parable and started reading it. Read it again. I said, so what? Read it again. I read the parable six times. The, I mean, literally, boom, 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 boom. The sixth time, I noticed something. The servant who had buried the talent, how did he describe his master? Anybody? We were scared of him. He said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow. Now, we... we Take from the parable, the master is God, right? So here's the servant telling God, I know you'd be a hard man, read it where you don't sow. Is that God? Is that the God we know? No, it's not. And the light went on. The servant was not condemned to hell because of what he did. He was condemned to hell because he had no relationship with the master. He didn't know the master. The action, the punishment came from the lack of relationship, not from the actions. But by the same time, those other two servants who, buried, who uh, invested the talents and brought a profit, why did they do that? Because they knew the master. And they knew that he was giving and loving and they wanted to bring a return to honor him. Okay? So look at the parables. Look about relationships. Look at, you know, the kingdom living is about relationships. That's what David's been driving home to us. All the examples, the, the people he healed, the people he taught, the people he fed, everything is based on relationship. And he was building into the relationship of his disciples stuff they didn't even remember at the time. They didn't notice, they didn't understand. But as the days went forward, they were fully equipped at the point of need. He says, don't worry about what you say in front of magistrates and rulers. For in that very moment, the Holy Spirit will give you the words. Where do those words come from? They come from the experiences that we have cataloged away in our minds that God's introduced us to. And we're seeing this through the job search. Um, let me share with you some counterposed thoughts between the way the world looks at the kingdom and the way someone... A, a child of God who understands looks at the kingdom and in the frame of reference of the job search. Worldview says, my job was taken from me. I was really good at it. I don't know why they let me go. They just were terrible to work for. My worth is in my job. If I can't get somebody to pay me, I'm not worth much. If I take a job that pays less, it means I'm worth less. I need to have a job with more prestige because then I'm more important. So many people come in and say, if I could just find the same job, whatever I was doing for XYZ company, if I could find it for at ABC company, they'll hire me. You know, that's my skill set, that's what I'm good at. If I, I get the same job, I can do it again. And they'll hire me and everything will be just fine. Well, what's interesting from a kingdom point of view is I love to ask people who have been fired or let go, when did you first see this coming? Typically, it'll be at least six months prior or longer. Yeah, I saw this coming. Yeah, things just weren't right. Things were building up. I should have left a long time ago. 
See, God is so gracious to us. When, when our time is done someplace, He lets us know. He says, yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm putting some other desires in your heart. Well, what happens is we're so connected to employment being our security, rather than God being our security, we start grabbing tighter and tighter and tighter. And God can say, I got something better for you. Well, I'm comfortable here. They really need me here. And we hold on so tight that finally God has to just take it away. Because he's got something better. So from the kingdom view, people really saw that, see that it's coming. So that my time there is done. I had accomplished what I needed to accomplish. I was feeling called to do something else. Um, another view. Um, understand, my work set by Christ is not set by my job. No employer is going to pay me that. So work is about... It's not about my worth, but about being renewed. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. You know, that's not just limited to a small aspect of what we do. That scripture's to everything, even to our workplace. And it's, this is actually a kingdom activity, because if you look at verse 1 that precedes it, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So all of this, our work is a part of our spiritual worship. When we understand that God provides it, that God has a purpose there, um, that He's using that to develop us to be what he planned for us to be before he reformed us in Mother's womb. And he has a lot of things he wants us to learn and to do. And it all doesn't happen in one place and in one job. You know, people, these graduations from kindergarten and elementary and stuff, they got real big now. Like put gowns on, they had certificates and things like that. How many kids who graduate from fourth grade and go through all that their parents turn around and re-enroll them in fourth grade again. No, nah, they won't go to fifth grade. If my time working for this employer is done, why don't I want to go find the same job working for somebody else? I'm done with that job. I've learned what God wants me to learn from that. Now, God says, I want to expand your tents. I want you to be able to handle more. And unless you try and do more, you don't know that you can do more. And so it's always interesting that people that have come into our sabbatical search group, I enjoy kind of tracking what they're looking for when they first arrive, and then what job do they actually take, and how much bigger is the job they take than what they thought they were looking for when they came in the group. That's a sign of kingdom thinking. You know, I'm sure the disciples had no idea when they were with Jesus how they would end up. But I don't think any of them were upset with how they ended up. Because Jesus, through his kingdom principles, showed them and grew them and made them what they were intended to be. And he's doing that with us. It's been a long time here. Oop, I got one minute. So, um, kingdom view is that God knows what's next, He does give us choices. If we pick one choice, we'll learn what's meant for that. If we pick a different choice, we'll learn what's meant in that. And God will give us another way to pick up what we missed. So we do have choices. We're meant to be a gift to those around us. In our employment, we are actually a gift to that employer, to the team members, to the customers, to the vendors. And a lot of times, the job that we get from our sabbatical search has nothing to do with the work. It has to do with being in the cubicle next to the person that gets the phone call. That's a kingdom perspective. Jesus stayed away when Lazarus died. Two extra days. If you do the math, if he had come back immediately, Lazarus would still have been dead. So why did he tarry two extra days? What was the difference? The difference was, in their culture, when the body started to decay, when it started to stink, 
up until that time, the spirit was trying to come back and reanimate the body. Once decay set in, the spirit left. So by waiting and coming back after, according to the Jewish teaching, the spirit had left, when Jesus called Lazarus forth, he absolutely showed that he had control over death and corruption. That's why, even though he had raised other people, that's why Lazarus got the leader so hot to kill him and Lazarus. Okay? So by waiting, he showed the fullness of his authority. God uses us to be that next person in that cubicle. And then while we're on that search, we have time to watch for the people that he puts in front of us that needs to be, have an education on their kingdom perspective. But I would suggest we don't, he doesn't have to put us in a job search for us to be aware of and take advantage of these lessons. What we do every day, we have that opportunity to display the kingdom as we've learned it from him. Just as he did it for his disciples, he's doing it for us today. Amen. Thank you for letting me share with you today. I hope uh, that there's something of value in there. I know there's something of value because it's God's word. And I don't mean to denigrate that. Let's pray. Close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray as we learn more about the kingdom view, your kingdom view, and how you use it to grow us that we can become more engaged in that process as well and see the work that you are doing in our lives. We look forward to next week coming back together with Dr. Lawrence teaching and the word that he brings. Be with our service today. Be with the men. Let them swing, sing well. And let Jim's words from, you, from your word be exactly what we need to hear. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.